Praise God. Father, we come before you in great anticipation, with great thanks. We are totally dependent upon your spirit, Lord. We regard you as God. So therefore, we declare that no flesh will be glorified today, but all will be done by your spirit, Father. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and all that he's made available to us. And Lord, we thank you that we have life through your son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks, we give you praise. We do declare that our hearts are good ground and that the seed of your word will come and fall on this ground, that it will take root and bring forth fruit of the spirit that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. We give you thanks, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you guys. You all can be seated, do the virtual high five, let everybody know that you're there. I want to give honor to Dr. Dollar, Pastor Taffy, uh, and uh, World Changers Nation. Thank God for you all being here. We're going to go ahead on and dive right into this. Um, we, Pastor, has been uh, speaking and talking about ungodliness, and uh, uh, I'm titling this message today, Unnecessary Trials. Now, um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's kind of a, a twist to that a little bit, but it's Unnecessary Trials. But the way that we're going to approach this is in line with what Pastor has been teaching on about ungodliness. Uh, unnecessary trials. You know, there are some things that as we get into this today, I'm going to give a disclaimer um, because it's going to be important that you hear what I'm saying because what I'm saying today is going to it can, it can tip over sacred cows. You know what I'm saying? Those, those sacred cows, and you hear about cow, uh, cow tipping. People go in the middle of the night out in the cow pasture, and the cows are asleep, and they just tip them over. <laughs> uh, these are some sacred cows in a sense, but it's supported by Scripture, so you'll understand what I'm saying when I explain this. But we're going to be talking about um, the Apostle Paul, and the thing about the Apostle Paul is just, just like the Bible says in, I think it's the book of James, where it talks about Elijah was a man with like passions, just like we are. But yet and still he did great and mighty things of God, but yet and still he was a man. And we know if anyone is a man and operating as a human, they are subject to errors and trials and mishaps and mess ups just like anybody else. That also includes the Apostle Paul. Now, in me saying this, of course, thank God, God used him mightily. He's the Apostle of Grace. He, he, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and all. But I want to share and support what Pastor had been talking about in terms of ungodliness and how we look at ungodliness oftentimes when we hear it, not having the definition and the understanding that we've gotten here late, lately, we will think of ungodliness as wicked people, uh, immoral people, uh, you know, just ungodly people. Uh, but we know based on the definition of ungodliness, which I want to go over that again, uh, we're going to see how something Paul did really brought about unnecessary trials in his life because he did not regard God in a particular thing. And you all are saying, what? Paul didn't regard God, at, you know, or the, or the Spirit of God in a particular area? Yeah, it's pretty clear in Scripture, and we're going to go over that. But what I'm trying to accomplish today isn't to make Paul look bad. It isn't to try to make anyone afraid of, um, you know, if, if there has been some disregard for God, uh, or anything like that. It's not about condemnation. It's to make us more keenly aware of the need and the necessary, uh, how necessary it is to listen to the Spirit of God and what He's saying when He's prompting us, when He's speaking to us, because of course God has our back. Amen? God has our back and God wants the best for us. It's His desires to give us the kings, uh, keys to the kingdom. So God, God wants what is best for us but it's listening to his spirit 
and what his spirit has to say. Now, as we talk about this, I'm, I'm speak on this just for a couple more minutes and then we'll dive right on into this. As we talk about this, this situation, this scenario that I'm gonna speak of today, it will sound very God-led. It would sound God-inspired, but it wasn't. So there are times when we can have ideas in our head and in our minds of what, be what we believe the Lord has said, and that's fine. When we get those, we should step out on those because we believe God has spoken to us and we're moving out on those things. That's what we should do. But if a word of God comes and says, no, that's not what you're supposed to do, and then the word of God comes and says, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. No, that's not what you're supposed to do. You need to change course, and you need to now regard what the word of God is now saying, even though you may have felt like what you had initially was right. So we can have a zeal for something, to do something, uh, um, uh, you know, a particular thing that we believe God said to us, but if we get revelation and the Spirit of God says, no, that's, that's not what I'm supposed to do, that's the case when it comes to the church and the, and the gospel of grace. Because you know religion says, uh-uh, nope, got to be about works. Can't be that simple, can't be that easy. You got to do something else. It's Jesus plus, 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 plus. But then the gospel of grace says, no, it's Jesus who's everything, so trust in him and don't try to add your works to your salvation. So that's what has happened. We've heard religion for years and years and years, and then the Spirit of God was coming trying to talk to us, but we were like, no, uh-uh, don't want to hear that, don't want to hear that. That goes against all that I believe, that goes against all that, all that, all that I know, don't want to do it. So we're going to get into this. This is going to be good. Now let's first look at the, uh, the definition There we go. Try to get the, uh, let's go back over the definition of ungodliness. When we were talking about ungodliness, we defined it as have, not having regard for God, not having regard for God, to disregard him, to neglect, to slight, or you don't take into account what God is saying. You don't take into account what God has said, or a failure to notice or acknowledge. Let me go over those again real quickly. Not having regard for God, to disregard him, to neglect him, to slight him. You know, you don't, you don't give it the importance, you, you, you don't give it the attention that you should give it to. Uh, to not take into account. So you're not taking into account what God has said. You're only holding to what you want to do and how you want to do it. So you're not taking into account what God has said or failure to notice or acknowledge. Failure to notice or acknowledge. So we define these things as, as ungodly, and you can see why that doesn't necessarily go along with the previous definition that we had of just being out and out evil, being out and out wicked, you know, because in many ways as Christians, we cannot take into account what God has said when we have a particular thing that we want to do or how we want to do it. Or we can disregard God. You know, Lord, I... You know, I'm being real. Now, I know what your word says, but this is being real, okay? No, you're, you're disregarding God. You're saying that your word, okay, that was nice and that fits in church, but that don't fit out here in the real world. You know, that's disregard, disregarding God, and that is ungodliness. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter, the first chapter, and the sixth verse. Um, and... We've laid this foundation with Titus 2.11. You all know that scripture, how the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. The grace of God teaches us 
where people are saying grace is a license to sin. No, grace teaches us to deny sin, to deny ungodliness, and to deny worldly lust. But here, as we're talking about um, unnecessary trials, I thought about this scripture that's been shared before in 1 Peter, uh, the first chapter and the sixth verse. It says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, if need be, those are the key words, if need be, talking about unnecessary trials, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. If need be. Now, we're going to use that scripture kind of as a basis to explain what we're about to go into as it pertains to Paul. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or manifold trials or uh, manifold tribulations, if need be. So you can find a situation where there is no need to be, <laughs> if need be or if need not be. So it's kind of like to be or not to be. <laughs> you make the choice here as to what you're going to deal with. Now, Paul was... Um, Paul... Paul was zealous before he came into his Damascus Road experience. He was zealous. Remember, he would go out and, and uh, uh, with a zeal, persecute the church, kill the Christians, round them up. He was the one who was holding uh, Stephen's coat while everybody else was stoning Stephen, and he was consenting to their death. So Paul was very zealous in the, in the law and, and bringing that about. But equally... That zealousness, when he went from the law and had his encounter with Jesus, the zeal was still there. But it now is a zeal according to knowledge. The Bible talks about that, that, uh, uh, that the Jews had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. But Paul had a zeal to preach the gospel equally as much as he had that zeal to go and destroy the church, he had this zeal to go and build the church now, uh, uh, but, and it was according to knowledge. So Paul had this zeal, this fire, this burningness to actually go and to preach the gospel uh, uh, to, the, to the Gentiles. And the Bible made it very clear that he was sent to the Gentiles in fact, let's, let's establish that real quickly. He, he was sent to the Gentile. That's, uh, let's go to Romans, the 15th chapter and the 15th verse. Paul was sent to the Gentiles just as Peter was sent to the Jews. Peter was sent to preach the gospel to the Jews. Paul was sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles says, nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, next verse, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to who? Amen. To the Gentiles. I am the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentile. What was he ministering? He was ministering grace or the gospel of grace. I, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentile, ministering the gospel of God, that the, uh, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul was the minister uh, uh, of the, the grace of God to the Gentiles. Let's go to Romans, the ninth chapter. Romans, the ninth chapter, and we start in the first verse. So I wanted to establish that, that Paul has been sent to preach unto the Gentiles. Um, however, uh, Peter was sent to preach unto the, to the Jews. He says here, uh, and follow me with this. I'm, I'm laying some groundwork so that when we take off, you guys will understand how, what we're taking off from based off of this knowledge, okay? So it says here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, next verse, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that, I might, that myself were accursed from Christ 
for my brethren, my kinsmen, accounting according to the flesh. Now, who is he speaking of now, Jew or Gentile? Jews. He's speaking of Jews. He's been called to the Gentiles, but now he's saying, he said, I got this heaviness in me. I, I got, he said, I would rather be accursed for my brethren's sake because they need to know about Jesus Christ. They need to have the gospel preached to them. For he said, for I, would, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Next verse. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of, of God and the promises. Next verse. Whose are the fathers and the whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Now, Paul has this zeal. He made it real clear. He's been sent to preach to the Gentiles, but he still has this heaviness in his heart to want to get the Israelites saved. He wants to get them saved. He said, I would rather be a curse myself if it's gonna help my flesh, my brothers, the ones that I came up with, the, the ones that I know where I came out of, I would rather be a curse to even let them come to know Christ as Lord. But he was called to the, to the Gentiles. Now, with all of that being said, let's now get into what, we, what we're gonna talk about. Let's go to uh, Acts, the 20th chapter. Acts, the 20th chapter. Now, Paul, and we're going to be studious today. I hope you all are okay with that. We, we, we're diving into the scriptures, and we're, we're kind of dissecting this stuff here so that we can really understand what I've, what I've uh, set up to talk about. So Paul here is dealing with um, uh, disciples. He's going kind of on his missionary journeys. He's, he's uh, going from church to church. Uh, and, and this particular place, he was, um, <clears throat> I think he was in Macedonia or, or going to Macedonia. He was around, around Macedonia and talking to the Christians in Macedonia. So as he was talking to the Christians there in Macedonia, Let's go to the uh, 20th chapter and the 20, uh, 22nd verse. Praise God. Well, I apologize. Let's, let's, let's set this up. Let's set this up first. Let's go to Act, the uh, 18th chapter and the 21st verse. Now, Paul was set on going to Jerusalem. Okay? Okay. Um, where was Jerusalem? Jerusalem where the, was where the council was. That's where Paul went and got counsel from James and some of the other brethren and all that. But Jerusalem was also where, almost like the seat of Israel. It was where the law was in full force and taught and practiced. It was where the temple was. It was where his brethren was, Jerusalem. Okay? So here in uh, uh, Acts 18, 21, Paul says, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. What feast was he talking about? The feast of Passover. I must by all means, I got to keep this feast that, feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. Let's go to uh, Acts the 19th chapter and the 21st verse. So he said, I must by all means keep this feast that is coming to Jerusalem, the Feast of Pentecost. Acts the 19th chapter and the 20th verse. It says, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, and that, notice that's a, low, a small s, so Paul purposed in his spirit, not the Holy Spirit, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, let's go to now Acts, the 20th chapter, and the 6th verse. So we've seen there twice where Paul is saying, I need to go to Jerusalem. I need to go to, to Jerusalem. Acts here, 20 and verse 6. Excuse me, 20 and 16, I apologize. Acts 20, verse 16. 
For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So here we see three scriptures. All of this is going to come together. I promise you all this is going to come together. We see three scriptures here where Paul is set on going to Jerusalem. Okay? Paul is set on going to Jerusalem. Now, let's get into this. Where Paul begins to disregard uh, the things that God has said. Now he see here, we see here from the three scriptures that we just read, Acts 18, um, 21, Acts 19, 21, and Acts 20, verse 16, that Paul was set on going to Jerusalem. What does this sound like? This sounds like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was set on going to Jerusalem. So here, Paul is the same way. He's set on going to Jerusalem. Now, I'm, I'm, it's speculative, but I would say Paul wants to go to Jerusalem so that he can preach the gospel to his brothers at Jerusalem. He wants them to get to know Jesus Christ uh, there at Jerusalem. He's set on doing that. Why is he set on doing it at Pentecost? Because that's when all the Jews are going to be there. It's going to be a packed house. It's almost like a uh, 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 freak Nick in Atlanta. It's like, <laughs> some of y'all like, freak Nick, what's that? Y'all ain't that old. Y'all know what freak Nick is. But anyway, everybody come. Or it's like a uh, spring break down in Daytona or down in Florida. All these people flock uh, to this location. So now let's read here while we're in the, in the book of Acts. Let's go to the 22nd chapter. We're going to read down through the 24. So... Paul is set on going to Jerusalem, but let's see what the Spirit of God has to say. Acts 20, uh, 21, excuse me, Acts 20th chapter, the 22nd verse. Acts 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 22. Okay. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit, once again, that's small. I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Next verse. Except, I do know this, the Holy Ghost witness in every city that I've been to, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Next verse. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we read this, this sounds, this sounds so spiritual to Paul. Paul has said, I got to go to Jerusalem. I'm bound in my spirit to go to Jerusalem. And we'll read in another version where it says, that he had this compulsion or he had uh, this feeling in his spirit to go to Jerusalem. So he said, I'm bound to go to Jerusalem. He said, the only, he said, I don't know what's gonna, uh, what I'm going to run into there, but the one thing that's been told me in every city is that you're going to run into afflictions. You're going to run into trials. But then he said, that don't matter because for God I live and for God I die. Amen. It don't matter. Now, all of that sounds good, all of that sounds spiritual, but it was unnecessary. Where Paul said, but none of these things move me, he said, neither count I my life dear unto myself, though, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of that's good, because what that tells us is Paul is of the mindset that nothing is going to separate me from doing the will of God. <laughs> Got that, Paul. That's cool. That's good. But Paul, right here, right now, you don't need to have that mindset. You see what I'm saying? You don't, now, you all don't see what I'm saying because I hadn't showed you yet. But let me, <laughs> let me show you uh, where we're going. Okay, so now, so he said, uh, in fact, let's, let's go to the message uh, version of Acts 
20th chapter and the 22nd verse. Let's go to the message, the message version. But there is another urgency before me now. Notice how this is stated. I feel compelled to go to Jerusalem. What Paul is saying is, I got this unction in me to want to do this. But what we're going to find out is that it wasn't spirit-led. He had this unction in him. He said, I feel compelled to go to Jerusalem. I'm completely in the dark about what, I, what will happen when I get there. I don't know. Uh, I do know that it won't be any picnic. <laughs> Next verse. For the Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonments ahead. All right. He's compelled to go, but in his spirit, he's compelled to go. Now, let's, let's get on into this. You guys kind of see where we're, where we're going with this? Paul had, though, we read those three scriptures. I got to go to Jerusalem. Got to go to Jerusalem. Got to go to Jerusalem. Then we read here, I'm compelled in my spirit to go to Jerusalem. But the one thing that's contrary, I don't know what I'm going to find in Jerusalem, but the Spirit of God has said, when you go, if you go there, you're going to run into hard times and tribulations. All right? Now, now let's read on. Let's go to Acts, the 21st chapter. We're talking about ungodliness and disregarding God or slighting him or what were those definitions that we gave? Failure to notice or to acknowledge. Okay, failure to notice or to acknowledge. Now, Acts the 21st chapter and the fourth verse. Acts the 21st chapter and the fourth verse. And let's go back to the King James. Okay. All right. So the Spirit of God has told him that when you go to, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to have hard times. It's not going to be any picnic. It's, it's going to be tough. It says here in Acts 21, 4, it says, And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit, notice the capital S, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. But Paul felt in his spirit We've already determined that in his spirit that he should go to Jerusalem. But here, disciples, they came and they said to Paul through the spirit of God, Paul the apostle, Paul the apostle of grace, Paul the one who, who, who wrote two-thirds of the, of the New Testament, they're coming and they're saying to Paul, Paul, the spirit of God has told us that you don't need to go up to Jerusalem. One time. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 12, 21, verse 12. They besought him not to go up to Jerusalem, 21, 12. And when he had heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. This is a different verse. This isn't repeating what I just read. This is the second time when they're saying to him, Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. You know what? Let's, let's put all that in context. Let's go back up to verse 4, and we're going to read down to verse 12 so you all will see what was said for them to say, Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Let's go up to Okay, let's go to uh, verse 5. So they had told him that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And when he had accompanied those, uh, accompanied those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way uh, with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to, uh, to, to, to Lanamus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, 
We that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the, uh, of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet. He took Paul's girdle and bound his own hand and feet. He, he didn't bound Paul's hands and feet, but he bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Next verse. And when they had heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Hmm. Now, Paul has been spoken to twice by the Spirit of God, by men and women who were men and women of God. They said, Paul, we know you got your face set like a flint to go to Jerusalem, but the Spirit of God is saying, don't go. You see here, you see where sometimes people can get stuck on a thing. No, this is what I'm supposed to do. No, uh-uh. You know, I believe God said this, but then a, a, a word from God comes. And then another word from God comes. And then another word from God comes. At that time, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, let every word be established. The Spirit of God has spoken. I don't care what you feel on the inside. You cannot at this point disregard God. So they told him, Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem. Um, next verse. Let's go ahead on and read, read the next verse. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? Why are you making this hard for me? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, you're missing this. You're missing this. See, it sounds spiritual. It sounds really good. You all see why I prefaced this with this disclaimer and said, you know, I'm not trying to put down Paul and make Paul look bad. But here, Paul was missing it. It's clear in Scripture. The Spirit of God has spoken to you I don't know how many times. I know you got your mind made up, but the Spirit of God has said, don't go. But Paul, you said... You know, I can see someone using this scripture. <sighs> Listen, I'm ready. I'm ready to be bound and also to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. You probably will, but you're not supposed to do it at Jerusalem because the Spirit of God said, don't go to Jerusalem. So, Paul, we acknowledge you. That's good. That's great. That's spiritual. That sounds really good. Sounds like you're sold out for God. Oh, man, that's great. But this is unnecessary, Paul. This trial is unnecessary. It's unnecessary that you have to go to, through stuff because I'm telling you, don't go. The Spirit is saying, don't go. So he said, he said I'm, also, uh, I'm also ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's, let's go to this next one because this next one is really, really good. Next verse. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, we stopped, saying the will of the Lord be done. Now, see, we got to understand what are these scriptures saying, because if you just take them out of context, it will sound spiritual. And it is spiritual, but it, it'll sound that you'll take it the wrong way and apply it the wrong way. They said when he would not be persuaded, we stopped. And we said, God's will be done. But see, that sounds like they're saying, okay, Lord, that's your will. He wants to go to Jerusalem. That's your will. Then your will be done. That is not what that scripture is saying right there. 
It is not the will of God. How do I know that? Let's read that in, a, in, a, uh, in another version. Uh, let's read this in the, let's go uh, do verse 14 in the message. Let's start in 13, we'll read 14. We'll just, yeah. Uh, you know what, that's okay. Let's just go on to 14. I know how the message has uh, put two or three scriptures together. It says, we saw that we weren't making even a dent in his resolve. And we gave up. It's in God's hands now, we said. Master, you handle it. He's not listening to us, flesh and blood down here who are empowered by the Spirit of God, speaking by the Spirit, thus saith the Lord, that if you go to Jerusalem, this is going to happen. God is using man to talk to him, but Paul is so set on going to Jerusalem, and they had to say, you know what? Uh, we saw that what we were saying, it wasn't even making a dent in Paul's resolve, because he's so set on going to Jerusalem despite what the Spirit of God is telling him to do. He said, so it wasn't, thou will be done, O God. What they were saying is, God, it's in your hands now. That's what they meant by your will be done. It's in your hand. We don't try to tell them, Lord, you got to handle this now. We, we can't do anything else. We don't ever want to get to that point to whether we disregard what God is saying to us to the point to where we, you know, we just get turned over and we end up, remember 1 Peter 1, 6, if need be, you go through heaviness and trials. This was one of those situations, if need be, but the thing about it is it didn't need to be. Now, Paul went through a lot of things. He spoke in 1 Corinthians, the... Uh, the 11th chapter talked a lot, uh, first or second Corinthians 11, I, I, I get them mixed up, but he was talking about all the trials and things that he went through. Now, yeah, he, in this world you'll have tribulation. He went through those trials, but the trials that he uh, encountered at Jerusalem, he didn't have to go through those trials. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. You all with me? Yeah. All right. So now, <clears throat> we see here what Paul has, uh, has done and what begins to happen to Paul is that uh, uh, let's, let's go back to the King James because I want to read this from the King James. So when Paul, uh, Acts 21, 14, you can start there and we'll, we'll go to, uh, uh, to other verses there. Um, because we, we see there, the interesting thing about it is that Paul had already had an encounter very similar to this. Some of y'all may remember just by reading your Bible that Paul was set on going to Asia at one time. Paul was set on going to Asia Let's go to Acts, the 16th chapter. Praise God. Acts, the 16th chapter. And let's start in the, in the sixth, uh, sixth verse. Acts 16, 6, and we'll read down to 16, 7. It says, now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia, Phrygia, excuse me, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost, to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to uh, Messiah, Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So Paul had already had experience of being led and guided by the Spirit of God. What was it so much that led him or made him want to go to Jerusalem. But he went ahead on and went to Jerusalem. So the Spirit of God had spoken and had already uh, told uh, Paul, don't go here, and Paul obeyed. Don't go to Asia, and Paul obeyed. 
But when it got to Jerusalem, he wanted to go to Jerusalem. Let's, now let's go uh, back to uh, Acts, the 21st chapter. And let's begin to read, read down on that. All right, Acts 21. Go to verse 14. <clears throat> All right. So let's start here. Uh, let's start in verse 20. Um, let's start in verse 27. Now, Paul has now at this point, he's already gone to Jerusalem. He disobeyed the spirit of God. The disciples said, God, he won't listen to us. You got to handle it. Your will be done. You got to handle this. Paul went ahead on and went to Jerusalem. And in verse 27, it says, and when the seven days were almost uh, ended, now Paul had made uh, a vow of purification with other Jews, uh, and it was a seven-day uh, vow of purification. At the end of these seven days, um, when it ended, the Jews which were of Asia when they saw him in the temple, they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Next verse. Now, Paul hadn't even been there seven days. And the Jews of Asia came because they didn't like Paul. They thought Paul was still trying to tell people to follow the law and all of that. And, and they got in an uproar. And they cried out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen uh, before, for they had seen before with him in the city uh, Trom uh, Trophimus, uh, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Keep reading. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Keep on, we're going to keep reading. And as they went about to kill him, unnecessary trial. Why do I say it's unnecessary? Because, Paul, you're not supposed to be in Jerusalem. You're not supposed to be in Jerusalem. If you would have regarded what the Spirit of God said, you wouldn't even be facing this situation. You might be facing another one, but you wouldn't be facing this one. It says, and as they went about to kill him, tidings came uh, unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centur uh, centurious, centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Woo! <laughs> I can just see, but Paul had already, already resolved it in his mind. You know what? I don't care. I'm going to die for Jesus. I, you know, Paul, that's good. That's good. But you ever heard this, Paul? Live to see another day. <laughs> Live to see another day, Paul. Uh, somebody say, I ain't got to die on this hill. I might die on the hill, but I ain't got to die on this hill. So be where you're supposed to be doing what God has told you to do. Then the chief captain came near and took him and, and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded uh, who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing and some the other and among the multitude. And when he uh, could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was, that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. In other words, they had to pick Paul up and carry him because these people were in such an uproar that they were trying to kill him by any means necessary. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him, away with him. In today's turn, that means kill him, kill him. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? Who said, uh, who said, the chief captain said, can you speak Greek? Okay. Are not thou uh, that Egyptian, which before these days made it an uproar and led it out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? 
But Paul says, I am a man which I am, of, uh, am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and a citizen of, uh, of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak to the people. Paul still, still, <laughs> Paul was a little deranged here. I, I mean, I have to say it. Bless it. I thank God for Paul. But Paul still want to speak to the people. Paul, why do you still want to speak to these people where you're not even supposed to be there? What is up with you, Paul? I would venture to say back in Romans, the ninth chapter, he said, I would rather be a curse for my brethren's sake that they might know Jesus Christ. Paul has such a zeal in him to preach the gospel, that it blinded him. Whereas he heard the Spirit of God say, don't go into Asia, don't go into this other city, and he obeyed. But when it came to Jerusalem, Paul had such a zeal to preach to the people of the Jews of Jerusalem, even though they just tried to kill him. He just told the captain, listen, can you just stop for a minute? Let me just speak to the people again. And I can see the captain like, you are out of your freaking mind. But he did, he says, and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people. And when there was made a uh, great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue unto them, they kept the silence. Uh, they kept more of the silence. In other words, you're speaking our language. You, let's, let's hear what you're saying. And he said, I am a very man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus in the city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way, this belief, this believing in Christ, unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, also, as also the high priest both, dear, uh, both bear me witness, and all of the estate of the elders, for whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, I was come nigh unto Damascus about noon. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, who art thou, Lord? These are, these are the, notice these two questions. These are two questions that every Christian should ask and, and, and follow. He, he answered and said, who art thou, Lord? Question number one. And he said unto him, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuteth. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to him. And he said, what shall I do, Lord? Who are you? First of all, God, who are you? Now we know who he is. He's revealed himself unto us. Next question is, what do you want me to do? What would you have me to do? What should I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all these things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one and I, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him, I could see. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, Jesus, and should hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarrieth thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning thee. Ah! Paul, here's another example of the Spirit of God, of God himself saying, 
Paul, get out of Jerusalem. They're not going to receive your testimony. And I said, Lo, Lord, they know that I'm in prison and beat in every synagogue, uh, uh, every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death. I kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee for far hence unto the Gentiles. Paul wants to still go to Jerusalem, but the Spirit of God says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, Paul, not to Jerusalem. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a man from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Now, I know I read all of that and I took all that time to read it because I wanted to share as well. When Paul on his Damascus road experience, the Spirit of God told Paul, he was talking with God face to face. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. They're not going to receive you there. Go to the Gentiles. But yet and still, Paul still was set on going to Jerusalem when the Spirit of God told him three, four times, don't go. Paul had a zeal for the people, but his zeal caused him to disregard God, operating in ungodliness. So here where we thought the wicked and the evil were ungodly, here Paul is actually acting ungodly. Now, here's the grace of it. The grace of God, even when Paul went to Jerusalem, and if you read, we were in verse uh, chapter 21. From chapter 21 all throughout the rest of the book of Acts, it's talking about Paul and all his trials and all his tribulations that he ran into. If Paul would have listened to God, Acts might have ended at chapter 21. <laughs> instead of 28. But my point here, of course, is to encourage us to listen to the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God confirms to us via whether we're reading the Word or whether someone else comes and gives us a Word or whatever, and the Spirit of God has confirmed, you make sure that you regard God's Word and change yourself to the point to where we're saying it's God and it's not me. What example do we have of this? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When his flesh said, God, if it's possible, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But Jesus quickly came into the understanding of what the Spirit of God had already showed and revealed to him. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We have those times when we are maybe uh, set on doing one thing, but the Spirit of God says another, let's grow up in our maturity in God as God is speaking to us to develop the ear to hear what he's saying and then the heart to do it. Amen? It's not so much about obedience and carrying out something. It's about believing that God has said this. I would think that if Paul would have just said, you know what, this is God. He, he's the one that I'm serving because we read all throughout the Old, uh, New Testament about serving God, serving God, following God, believing God, trusting God. But it was interesting in this one time that his zeal overtook him and he missed God in that case. But the grace of God covered him still as he was going on. He still ran to trials, tribulations, but he was still able to preach. He was still able to do things. The grace of God helped him but he, it was an unnecessary trial. Amen? Praise God. All right, did you get anything out of this? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the goodness of your word. We thank you, Father, as you reveal unto us the need to listen to your spirit, to regard your word, to believe you, to trust you, to rely on you even regardless of ourselves, regardless of our preconceived ideas, regardless of our pre-knowledge, pre regardless of any of that, Father, we are to regard you and therefore operate in godliness. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity.